humanity has been in an abusive relationship with the narcissistic uh, deep state and nobody can take us out of it. We need to just wake up ourselves. And sometimes when you're in an abusive relationship with a partner, whatever it is, whatever level, you need, if you don't realize and you don't have the courage to get out, you need to take hits until you, you say you're fed up and you just go, that, that's enough now, enough. And you just stop consenting to be abused and you move on and you just, you take away. Actually, you don't need to kill your abuser. You need just to take the power away from them. That's all you need to do. Stop feeding them. Stop saying yes. You say, bye. You ignore them. You take the power away and they just wither. You're listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. Well, it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome Alex Collier and Elena Denam to Exopolitics Today. Welcome, both of you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. It's always an honor and a privilege to be in the presence of two such great beings. Well, you, you are, you're so humble, Alex, given your 30 years of history in this. I, I feel very humble just uh, being in the same Q&A with you. So I do have... Same I do have... I do have a bunch of questions for you both, and uh, I thought it'd be good to start off with uh, these these fleets of extraterrestrials that arrived in our solar system uh, last year, and both of you have talked about them, and you've talked about them being here to kind of watch a transition, to watch this kind of handover of, of power. So... What 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 uh, what's the latest information you have about these fleets and, and and what are they doing? Your Grace, why don't you go first? Well, um, they are um, meeting. Well, this fleet, this fleet who arrived, I was told uh, in October two thousand twenty-one, uh, behind Jupiter. Uh, I suppose they arrived through the portal. They are the Stargate. They station, they're still stationed there. That's huge fleet of ships. They are from the Intergalactic Confederation. Because if they went to the trouble to come here, which is not trouble for them, but you know, it's also because they are taking part uh, of it by preparing, helping humanity of Earth to prepare for the future. The Galactic Federation of Worlds and other groups of the, the Alliance have done a big job in the this star system, but now the Intergalactic Confederation is um, meeting different delegations from Earth, from Mars, I've seen that, to just um, set up what's, what's coming. So oh, um, they're still working on that and on the disclosure as well of their presence by showing up their ships more and more. And there's also the arcs that have activated, but that's another topic we can talk about later. That's, that's what I know. Thank you. Uh, Alex, uh, do you have kind mm -hmm. of anything to add to that, you know, given the Andromeda Council's uh, long history in observing events in our solar system? Well, you know, there have been a lot of, fleets coming and going. So it, it isn't like they just showed up. I mean, there've been, there's been an extraordinary amount of traffic <clears throat> coming and going, uh, but a, a semi-permanent presence, that's relatively new. Now, you have to remember that our fifth dimensional brothers and sisters, they come from the future. So they, they have a very, they're looking for a very specific process of growth and evolution in order to make their future happen. Now, when they come back here in the past, you know, they're looking from fifth dimension and what we're looking at is like, it's, it's almost like a puzzle 
uh, in a Rubik's cube. Everything has to line up to a specific way in order for a frequency or energy um, to lock in place. So it, it's, it's almost like a combination lock, all right? Um, everything has to turn, all the numbers, all the frequencies, all the events have to line up in a specific way so that the future locks in place. Just to add to what um, Elena just said, they're here to make sure that all the frequencies and all the events line up the way they're supposed to. So that the evolution of third dimensional humanity proceeds the way it's supposed to, so that in their future, everything's copacetic. Okay, there's, there's no more insanity. There's no more um, well, there's just no more insanity. I, I don't know how to say it any better than that. Um, and you know that that's just not literally the human race. When we shift our frequency, uh, it changes other races and other species as well. It's, uh, it, it's, it's the pebble in the pond. You know, it's nice and calm. You drop the pebble in the right place, the frequency, the wave goes out everywhere. That's exactly what's happening. And for, you know, some reason, and, it, you know, maybe it has to do with all the star seeds that are here. Uh, you know, there's well over 200 million star seeds on the planet. So many different star nations have a very serious invested interest in the outcome of this, of this drama that's being played out here. Not to mention the fact that the Orion group has been a major pain in the ass for a very, very long time in this galaxy. You know, and for everyone to be able to get that off the table and close those files would be huge. You know, because they have all had to vest resources dealing with these, these beings um, who simply don't know how to create their own reality. They have to screw up everybody else's. So I know both of you have talked about the the negative ET groups and 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 that they are kind of like on the run. That their power base in our solar system has kind of more or less collapsed, and that they are leaving or have left already. Uh, now, but both of you have also mentioned uh, that a key part of the presence of the of these high dimensionals or the galactics, the inner planet, uh, the intergalactic confederation, is to ensure that the white hats follow through on their obligations. So I just wanted uh, both of you to just kind of elaborate on, on why it's important for these uh, higher density ETs that are here to watch and ensure that all the frequencies line up, as, as Alex was saying, follow through on their commitments. Yep, Alex. Can I go first? Okay. Um, you know, the appropriate way to describe the Alliance and, and the, the Federation is, you know, it's, it's probably just the one word guardians. You know, maybe that's the best way to describe um, their very, their very specific uh, role here is, is guardians. They're acting as guardians. Now, as far as making sure that the White Hats follow through, they also, they understand that They understand power in a way that we're still learning as a species. Now, you know, the road to hell is paved with best intentions. You can go too far um, in the process of learning power. 
Now, yes, the White Hats forever have watched the abuse of power. They have watched it. They have done everything they could to curtail it. But here, the pendulum is swinging, and it's swinging towards the light, for lack of a better word. Now, will there be responsibility in that exercise of power? Because now it, it's not literally, um, it's not swinging into, into the center. It's swinging all the way into the light. And some of these people or beings that are here that we call white hats, they've also been dark hats. They have realigned their presence, their frequency, and their purpose. As any parent, you want to make sure, or guardian or mentor, you want to be sure that the follow through is consistent with real ethical morality. Not only on a human level, but on a spiritual level as well. In other words, oh, you know, there just aren't, I, I see it in my head perfectly, but there's just no words sometimes to, to explain That's all I got at the moment. Okay. Well, maybe Elena, um, you can elaborate on yeah. on that particular issue. Help I know that's been that. part of the some of the things you've been saying about the Jupiter Accords and the White Hats having a lot of expectations on them, you know, doing the right thing. So if you elaborate. Thank you, Michael. Well, maybe the, the concept I, I feel Alex tried to explain is that it's not happening only on a third dimensional level with right. political and social uh, connection and agreements with people. It has repercussions sim it simultaneously in different realms of existence and densities. So um, whatever action the White Hearts, for instance, do in their third dimensional plane, this plane where the agreements are made, the upper level of these agreements in higher dimension of consciousness um uh, it's it's you know it follows so it's all about trust it's all about trust um all these white hearts we're talking about they were they are human beings like all of us and they've learned uh, they made mistake. That's why they learn. How they learned, most of them. And um, so now they they've reached this status or where they're aware and willing uh, to to step forward into the future. So these agreements have been made with uh, the federation and all the councils, uh, galactic councils uh, that had been set on Jupiter last July. Well, we know about that, but then they need to respect it. It's a um, an, an oath of honor as well uh, uh, on a soul level that if they fail, you know, it's um, how it's difficult to find words in this. That's like, yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think what she's trying to say is that their, their intention and their purpose has to be resolute. Yes. They have to follow through and they have to abide by that they can't at some point in the future say, well, we're going to change this because we feel this way. That is not how this works on a galactic level. No. Okay. No. Because we have a symbiotic relationship. We have star seed. We have multidimensional life here. It changes everything. And when I said, you know, the locking in of frequencies, it's about everyone moving the same way, yeah. okay, in the same direction simultaneously. That's what it's about. You know, exactly. we can't decide, okay, hey, we're, we're going off-road now. We've been off-road. 
you know, for 8,000 years, you know, and look at the havoc it's wreaked. It, hell, it's it's taken a third of the galaxy to come here and straighten it out. Yeah, and it's catching a train, if I can use this metaphor. The train is uh, shifting into higher density because the third density is collapsing. So catching this train is becoming uh, on this frequency, uh, shifting on this frequency, becoming some someone honest and, uh, you know, in tune, in resonance with this new vibration we're entering to i was shown that the earth is entering into this higher frequency in this area in the galaxy and that that we need to follow you know so that that's this as well um if i may say okay um i want to know a little more about the the guardians or the cedars in terms of what they've done historically on the planet and I, I know in the Council of Nine material, uh, they talked about the 24 civilizations. You, you mentioned 24 and that they go back far into our history and that at different points in time, they've seeded different civilizations. So, for example, Atlantis was seeded by the Altians, according to the Council of Nine material uh, that Phyllis Schlemmer channeled uh, what, 30 years ago. 40 years ago, actually, um, th that the, the Hoovers created the Hebrew nation and so forth. So, you know, what do you know about the, the Guardians or the Cedars and their relationship with these ancient civilizations, you know, many of which have, are long gone, but some of which are still playing a big role in human affairs? I think Alex has a lot of knowledge about that. My, my humble knowledge is that they um, they left colonies, they set of colonies a very long time ago, and they left here technology uh, hidden a little bit everywhere uh, as a time capsule for future times, which are actually now. We are at the other end of the bridge. Um, they they seeded a few, few genomes here, but, you know, it's not one race. It's different species and races among them. So, um, but I, I know Alex has more uh, information about that. Well, <clears throat> you're you're the expert on the on the council councils, um, but you know, I when you, when you refer to the cedars, are you referring to the Batal? Yes, yes. Because I, I yes. don't. I've never read any of the um, the Council of Nine or or any of that. That's never been. A huge interest for me, um, and it, and it's not yeah. to invalidate it in any way. That that's not my point. It's just, you know, I I've just I've had a lot of life going on at the same time, so I just never had the time uh, to focus on it. But if, well, if we're referring to the Patal and the Cedars being the same, yeah, um, my understanding is is that they were able to scale into dimensions that were already created by source and they created physicality. Before you can seed any life, you have to create the space for it, for life. That's what they were doing. They created the physical places where life could be seeded. And understand that when you have a piece of DNA or genome, what it will look like and the shape it will take form of in fifth density will be very different than that in third density, okay? Even though you're dealing with the same sample, because of the resonance, the frequency, and the bands of uh, light, you are going to have a different outcome. There will definitely be similarities, but they can be, at the same time, extremely different because the DNA and the genome has to adapt to the frequencies that it's living in or that it's forming itself. Uh, it, it will also express the intent of the spiritual consciousness that's there. So it's, it's who, whoever God is, she's quite complicated. <laughs> She's quite complicated. Um, and, and I mean that sincerely. She's quite complicated. 
there's a great deal of depth there that none of us can fathom mm -hmm. still. Um, and I can speak for the yeas on fifth. They're still trying to fathom how complicated she is. Yes. So when we're talking about the cedars, the guardians, and how they've been involved in uh, human history dating back many, many millennia, and that they kind of left behind technology or maybe the civilizations that they supported left behind technology. And so, you know, this technology, is that kind of like the same thing as these arcs that we find becoming active? I mean, are these kind of like, I know people have talked about uh, the Sphinx having a chamber underneath it of technology. And I remember some people have talked about the Sphinx having uh, some kind of 4D, 5D spacecraft in there with all this incredible technology. Is that what we're talking about, that, that these ancient civilizations, when their day came for them to pass from the scene, that either they or the ETs they work with left behind these technologies or spacecraft filled with these advanced technologies for a day when uh, mm -hmm. humanity would be ready again for this advanced tech? Again, either one, one of you... I'll, I'll give you, okay, let, let, that, that's, that's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. Now, you, you mentioned the Sphinx. Well, you know, Thoth, the brother of Marduk, uh, is the one who's responsible for putting a lot of that there and coding it for a specific time to open. Um, many of these extraterrestrial civilizations that pass through here and have left technology behind, I, I, it is my understanding that not all of them had intended for it to be used by future civiliz or civilizations to come after them. A lot of the time what happened was they were constantly evolving. And as they, they were evolving, so was the technology. A lot of the technology that is advanced to us was their throwaway stuff. They didn't need it. They couldn't use it where they were going, or it simply was baggage, and they simply decided they didn't need to bring it with them, so they left it here. Now, we're, we're not, you know, we're talking about advanced, multidimensional, tachyon, um, quantum technology. <clears throat> We're not talking about a Ford where its planned obsolescence is nine years. For example, in the rings of Saturn, there are ships, mining ships that are 10,000 miles long and they still have robotic crews, Android crews servicing it and working it. It's still operational, even though there's no one doing any mining. It's still on. It still works. They don't build anything to break down because you're in space. You know, you don't build anything to break down. You build it to run forever or until you take it somewhere and you break it down. So, you know, and we're also talking about advanced energy propulsion systems. So there's you know, it's not like they have to pull up to a filling station and say, hey, you know, fill her up. The universe is full of energy and they knew how to tap into it. And the equipment does exactly the same thing. It knows how to tap into it because the ships are organic. They're alive. They were built to be living organisms. Okay. So... That's what we're finding out. That's what we're discovering is that civilizations that may have been a million years through this part of our galaxy, for whatever reason, they left things behind. They decided they didn't need to take it with them. So it's left behind. And, you know, this is not new to the, to the A's, to the Pleiadians, to those in Cygnus, those in Arcturus. 
Cirrus uh, A, B, this is not new. They've run across this stuff all over the galaxy and other galaxies. Equipment that was just left behind, that's still operational. Now, can we get into it? Do we have the genetic coding to actually get inside and use this technology? That's a whole nother question and a whole nother conversation because we don't know how this equipment was locked. Because if this equipment fell into the wrong hands and was used for totally nefarious reasons, that reflects back on the creators of that technology. Yeah. So these things may be turning on, but can we use it? Can we actually get inside of them? Do we have access to their capabilities? These are the questions that I would be asking. And Space Force, the A's, the P's, and whoever else is part of the Jupiter Accords and the other 24 uh, council races, <clears throat> those are the questions that we have to be asking them because it could be some of that equipment belongs to their ancestors, their forefathers and foremothers. You know, it, it's difficult to know, Michael. Um, <clears throat> you know, consciousness is unlimited and, and so can technology. So can the ability of technology mm -hmm. be unlimited. Yeah, well, we will come back to that question mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, one, one of my sources, JP, actually has had concrete experiences with that. But I just want to give Elena the opportunity to maybe comment a little bit about this uh, ancient technology that's been left behind and, and the Sphinx and this so-called hall of records and the craft underneath there. Thank you, Michael. Well, um, these ship, these technologies, it's not really ships, you can call them arcs. It's alive. They are allotted with consciousness and they are existing simultaneously in different densities. This is due to the, 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 the composition of their physicality, which is made with crystals, it's crystal uh, materials. And such is their, their ships, the ships of the, the Intergalactic Confederation or the Guardians. They're made with crystal. I went in one of them. And uh, first thing I, the first thing I, um, that shocked me because I never seen that before. The architecture was organic and the ships were feeling like alive, like conscious. And when you go inside it, there are crystals everywhere. It's uh, n n clusters, not walls like bare walls made with crystals, Crystal crystalline structures and clusters. And it's, it's quite amazing. This in building consciousness and their technology allows this, this technology to be alive in different density at the same time. So if you alter it, it will be altering all the other densities and they're all linked together by uh, a global consciousness. They are all like, you know, um, that's why when they arrived, the guardians arrived in our star system, well, this big fleet, um, because as Alex was saying, coming and going, um, by resonance, all the conscious technology that had left everywhere in the star system awakened, resonated, suddenly were put in resonance and woke up. I believe that at the time these people were here on Earth a very long time ago, their vision was maybe to live in harmony with the humans of earth and share a civilization of technology and peace, but a dark evil came. So things went bad and they had to go and they left behind. What they, of course, they it didn't bother them to leave these things behind because they didn't need it, but also they left this in, in their mind, probably to when, for the day when they come back, it will be because the people of earth will have gotten rid of the big, the great evil and will be then ready 
to use this technology and that's happening. I, I know these, these ships, this technology, it's reacting with the DNA of the people who create them, who built them. So you need to have the right DNA to be able to activate them. And that's why also many, many of us who carry this DNA of these guardians, not the whole planet, but many of us have this DNA in our blood, in the blood of these vessels, bodies. These people awaken as well, and these people are able to activate this technology and use it. And uh, they are sent in these arcs probably to, to activate them and just, you know, see how it works. Um, I don't know. I know about something under the Sphinx in Giza. I've been shown that twice, uh, one by um, astral travel. When I was young, I was shown what's underneath. It's rooms with buried, structured with um, crystal, crystal eggs. I, I've been shown crystal eggs that when you tune in with your consciousness, there's a holographic um, universe that appears and you're in it and it shows you things. And also when I used to be an work as an archaeologist in Egypt in my early 30s, I met uh, Zahi Hawass, Dr. Zahi Hawass. I had a little uh, mission for him working on, in Giza. And uh, he said, one day he said, hey, come, I'm going to show you something. And they were uh, repairing the Sphinx, the foundations, because it was very uh, uh, salt, etc. There was the entrance of a tunnel that he showed me. And he said to me, the, the entrance, the real entrance is between the poles of the Sphinx, but there's a stella that has been put. And they said, he said that there were um, corridors with rooms underneath that they had found, but it was a bit flooded. He, in, he invited me to to go down and unfortunately um, it was quite physical and uh, I suffocated, I had a panic attack, claustrophobia and I had to go back. It was really going into you know, um, a tube, a tunnel and um, I, I regret this, <laughs> but there were rooms and I know it corresponds to what I was shown. So I know that is there are somewhere under the Sphinx. Well, when it comes to having the right DNA, um, I know my army source, JP, he has been taken into these Sphinx recently on covert missions with the army, but he was telling me about these, sorry, into these arcs. He was telling me about, the, about these arcs back in 2014 and that he was, that he was being taken into them uh, by different ET groups and by covert operatives and that he was able to go in. And it was quite clear to me then that you know, they were using him to find out what was going on in there yeah. or the ETs were preparing him for a future time. He said, that, you know, there's a future time coming where, you know, these arcs will surface and, you know, they will represent the future of humanity in some way, whether it's to evacuate, whether it's to help us uh, move yeah. forward. Uh, in some way. So fast forward now, I mean, in the last uh, six months or so, I mean, he's been on several missions to these arcs and he's described going in them and that when he goes in, that only a few people can activate the technology in there, that things light up when these people move in there. And it's exactly what you were saying, that some people have the DNA, but many others don't. He was saying that not that it's only a minority have the have the DNA have that have that ability for these technologies to switch on, and I guess it's I mean Alex, you said two, there's 200 million star seeds on the planet. Well, if you if you um, kind of calculate, well, we've got like eight eight billion people, so two 200 million. What's 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 that? That's that's about um, that's about Four percent or something like that. It's only a small percentage of uh, eight eight billion. My math. I need to check my math there. But we're talking a small percentage of the population. But that sounds about right in terms of 
many of the star seeds do carry the genes within, within them or the frequencies to activate these technologies. And I remember JP was saying how much the, the covert operatives were leaning on him to join the military because they wanted to use him more on these missions. Uh, but there were constraints because as long as he was a civilian, I mean, he, he told me in 2014 he was taken to one of the one of these surface ships parked above the uh, an ark, but he was refused entry. There was an admiral there that said, no, you can't go because you're a civilian. Get out of here. So eventually he joined and he went into that ship in the Atlantic Ocean in the Bermuda Triangle twice in the last few months. So, yeah, they definitely are looking for star seeds. They're looking for people with the right DNA because the, the military, you know, whether we're talking about white hats, black hats, they don't have the, the genetics, so they call on the star seeds that do. So yes. either one of you want to kind of elaborate more on the genetics and the DNA that's necessary to activate these technologies? Um, it's like um, it's a resonance. It's You need to be at the right frequency to activate the frequency because you 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 bind with the ship we bind with the the consciousness of the 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 vessel and there is an interaction and you can um activate it and control it uh, because it's the same frequency exactly and yeah it's, i don't know how to explain it better alex <laughs> um the military is fully aware, both light and dark, that many souls have come back in time to this moment. The frequency of a soul cannot be duplicated. It not, cannot be copied. Even if you make a clone, it is never the same as the original, ever. And they know that, you know, which is why they spent all this money doing all this dastardly shit, you know, to figure that out. That, you know, when you take out someone and then you try to copy them, it's never the same. So, yeah, they, it, in order for some of this technology, which maybe some of us left behind, or we interacted with in one lifetime, multiple lifetimes, multiple dimensions. Um, you know, I've, I've told the story about when the A's make a ship, when they're building and growing the ship, before it's actually ready to, um, to take off on its first mission, each of the crew gets underneath it and they stand on a, a lighted platform. They put their hands on the surface, the outside surface of the ship and a resonant frequency and something comes through their body and it goes into the hull of the ship. Now the ship knows them. So they and the ship are one. The ship is an extension of them and they in turn are an extension of the ship, okay? Frequency, holographically, et cetera. Now, if you're not a member of the crew, you will not get inside that boat, that ship. It isn't going to happen. And it will do everything it can to make sure that you're removed from the equation. It can do that in a multiple of ways. It all depends on how it's programmed. Well, these arcs, they're absolutely no different. And what they're looking for are the people who operated or were part of the crew at this point, because the belief is, is we can get in there, we can figure out the technology and use it. That may or may not be true either. Because again, when you get to the control panel, it has to be a member of the crew, you know? So they obviously think JP is a member of of one of the crews, which is why they're using him. Uh, you know, it's it's absolutely fascinating. 
it, it, it really is. Well, these arcs um, uh, seem to be popping up all over our solar system and all over the all over the Earth. And of, of course, we don't get to hear too much about the ones popping up um, in other planets or on moons. But the ones on Earth, apparently, these are now activating, and this is something that can't be hidden for too much longer. I mean, is is this part of the kind of big picture uh, disclosure that is driving all of this? I, I, I've, been, I've been wondering whether the arrival of these fleets recently and the activation of these arcs has kind of triggered a countdown, a disclosure countdown, if you like, that at some point these arcs are going to start floating and and that's it, you know, game over because it's like, you know, how are you going to explain away these uh, miles-long motherships that are suddenly floating um, all over the planet? Um, I, I know Elena knows this, um, and Michael, I'm sure you do as well. There are many people who are having out-of-body experiences or are traveling, soul traveling, when their physical bodies are asleep and they're going to ships and they're being taught and they're being educated. What if some of that is actually going on, but they're actually going on a, on a soul level to these arcs and they're on the inside? So what's happening on some level, probably in fourth, maybe even fifth density, they're going to these ships, to these arcs, and the crews are re-engaging with each other after this long period of having been asleep or have been separated through different types of physical physicality and dimensional physicality. But what's happening is that, that these crews are reuniting yeah. on some of these boats. You know, that, that's something that cannot be dismissed as impossible because, you know, all of us who have worn tinfoil hats are now wearing crowns of knowledge because we were ahead of the curve. So um, I would suspect that some of that is actually going on that, you know, because your soul in fourth and fifth density has a physicality, right? So you're there, you'd be able to operate equipment and do all the things that you think you could only do in third density. It's really an, an extraordinary time. So, so do you think we're, we're kind of like on this uh, disclosure countdown with these arcs that that's, uh, that's what they, they're all yeah. about? Even yes. if the arcs weren't here, we're still on a disclosure timeline. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Even without anyway. it. Yeah. Anyway. And they are, they are so sure that uh, these arcs won't fall into, the, into bad hands because we are getting rid of uh, our human uh, uh, dark uh, controllers, you know, all these, these people. We are doing our job. You know, the ETs, they have removed the ET equations. They've gotten rid of the greys, rid of the reptilians in the star system. Now it's to the people of Earth to get rid of their human problems. And that's what, what they are doing at the moment. But the galactics, they and the intergalactic people anyway, they are so sure that we are doing it because they know the future. They know what's going to happen now because this, we, as Alex was saying, we're swinging towards the, 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 the good timeline, positive, progressive timeline. And so now that, um, you know, this technology, this technology won't fall into the, the, the bad hands. You know, they some had found these arcs. Some, you know, I know the Dark Fleet had its their hands on one in Antarctica, and they couldn't figure it out how to activate it. Why? Why the Nazi were so obsessed with ancient civilizations and trying to find, um, um, you know, ancient astronaut technology, and they were so obsessed by archaeology. But whatever they found they could never activate it because you need to be on a certain level and you need to have the right DNA. So that's what all the troubles that they, they were, they were making 
They want this power and they want the people with the right DNA. Um, I know um, in few other places on earth, some dark governments have had hands on, on them. Uh, recently, Thorhan told me that in, in Ukraine, the arcs was, was already discovered by uh, shadow government and they, they were trying to, to activate it and did nothing they could do. It was impossible. They couldn't. But then the arcs started to activate by themselves. And now then it needs to be in the right hands. <laughs> You know, but it, it, it does. So, yeah, I don't know what. Yeah. Well, I think the guardians are here to make sure that that happens. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and they're going to make sure it happens. It's just like, okay, you put a bunch of humans in a room and you remove the oxygen. What happens? They cross over. Well, with the dark side, if you remove the frequencies and you remove the food source and their energy, they die. They leave. And that's exactly what's happened. Um, you know, there's, there's still crap going on here, but it's more of a human element than it is an, an extraterrestrial element. And, um, you know, we have our work, we still have some work cut out for us in, um, in removing that human element and, and setting it straight, or I don't know if there's a better word for it removing it from the equation if necessary finishing the job yeah well i not everybody knows what that means yeah <laughs> right. i'm a john wayne fan removing them from the equation you know <laughs> yeah that's um, right. i've had every opportunity to figure it out and uh so you know their their dna has been um categorized in the the a file which stands for assholes so i'm i'm, I'm retiring soon so i can i can say what i want at this point <laughs> that's that's great um and Lena, i know you've you've received messages from forehand about this uh ukraine arc and and this how the deep state People got their hands on it and they couldn't activate it. And it was time for uh, that to be controlled by the White Hats. So, I mean, you're really saying that this is one of the major reasons for the Russian intervention in, in Ukraine. I mean, is this because this is one of the things that uh, I actually fascinated me when I first got involved in exopolitics was, you know, what was the real reason for uh, the U.S. intervention in Iraq, you know, I mean, they talked about the weapons of mass destruction, oh, yeah. but really it turned out that they, they were there for stargates, to, okay. the U.S. intervened for stargates. And one of the things that they did was uh, they made a beeline for this ancient Sumerian city, Ur, uh, where, where the, the stargates were and where the records of Gilgamesh were kept. And that U.S. military did this and they built a big base around uh, the, 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 you know, the, uh, the city of Ur or the ancient, what was left of it. So now we're seeing Russia kind of did the same thing in Ukraine. I mean, the first city it captures or the region it captured was uh, Kherson, and that's where this ark is located under the ground uh, of Olensh Oleshki Sands National Park. So, again, the same playbook where it's like, you know, there's an ancient technology there and you get your military guys to go in there and that's the first place they secure yes a month ago i think um i i passed on to you this message from thoran we're talking about the arcs he he said he couldn't disclose all the places uh where they are on earth for safety reasons and we totally understand that but he mentioned few of them, it was South America, the one in the uh, Atlantic Ocean, uh, what, which was the biggest. Uh, he said um, Europe, Central Europe, and Russia, North and West. Two arcs in Russia he mentioned. So um, Giza was on it as well. But yeah, and then it was before everything um, went like this in Ukraine. 
Well, all that's it's just a distraction. Yeah. You know, no matter what you say about that situation, we're going to trigger somebody. But, you know, there's also black league ships here. Yes. Yes, there are. Yes, there are. Can you elaborate on that, Alex? What, who, who, <clears throat> what is the black league? Sh- who are the black league sh- uh, ships? Well, some of them were called dragonflies or what we would call a dragonfly. And um, now I'm not referring to a, uh, an X-Wing from Star Wars, but have you seen the new Dune movie? The new version of Dune? Not yet. Okay. Um, they have something that's very, very similar to a Black League dragonfly. On the on the uh, on the planet with the spice, it's very very similar. In fact, I was blown away to see it. Our solar system was because of all the planets and asteroids was a very good place to hide um, after attacking huge Orion convoys. And many of us never made it out of this solar system. And we planted our ships in specific areas. Now, here in the U.S., the Southwest was idealistic for that because of the weather. Um, And all of the caves that existed. And there are places from Palm Springs all the way to to the Texas border where there are craft waiting to be turned on. And, you know, they hold crews of three, four, five. That's max. And um, they're weaponized craft. They're weaponized. That's what they were used for. So, you know, and there are people who are hearing my voice who have known me for years who know exactly what I'm talking about because um, we have, we know of places that we cannot access yet. And we know what's what's hidden there, but we just can't access it yet because the time wasn't appropriate. So no. many star seeds then are kind of freedom fighters from this black league that uh, oh yeah have oh yeah behind tech oh yeah you know you're you're very clear about right and wrong, and it's it's very easy to pick a side. And, you know, you always champion the underdog. I don't know what it is, but we just do. We just know, and that's exactly where we're going to go. We're going to champion the underdog. And we've always done that, you know, and there, you know, there are, trillions of star seeds all over the galaxy and in other galaxies. I mean, if we have just 200 million on this planet, imagine what's out there that's still rooting for us in other worlds or other places, or they're part of the crews of the ships that are here now, the fleets. You know, they've done this work in other lifetimes. And, you know, that's the contrast, you know? I mean, that, that's how we evolve in, 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 in amazing ways is, is because of the contrast. We're confronted with the contrast and we make choices, we make decisions, you know? And Chief, Chief Joseph of the Nez Pierce, 
you know, had a, a, an amazing quote, you know, wisdom comes from experience and experience comes from poor judgment. Yeah. You know, we've all been there yeah. in this life and in others, you know, and, and, and generally the poor judgments are because we lack information, but we're forced into a situation where we have to make a decision. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't always turn out the way we think, you know. Well, one of the things that I think excites people the most is the prospect that a lot of these advanced technologies that were left over or were used in these ancient civilizations and you know, carried over, whether it's in the arcs, whether it's the ETs, whether it's uh, through uh, Space Command and its collaboration with uh, different ET groups or other nations, is that a lot of this advanced tech is is going to be released. And I know... A lot of the most advanced technology has been suppressed for well over 100 years now, going all the way back to Tesla. So is now the time when all of a sudden we're going to have a flood of these advanced technologies suddenly being released? Uh, and, and kind of like, you know, is it going to be like all of a sudden we're given these advanced technologies by the ETs working through organisations like Space Command or working with private companies like uh, SpaceX and Starlink, or will it be just through um, inventors all of a sudden, you know, reinventing the wheel that, you know, the pressure's off, that they can file patents with the patent and trademark office and and it's not going to be just locked away under some secrecy order, you know, gathering dust, but it's like, okay, the patent will be granted and now they can go and build an anti-gravity craft or build a, a, a hollow... A, um, a holographic uh, healing device or something like along those lines? Well, I think all the patents are already there and it's just a matter of releasing them and uh, into uh, the society. And all most of these technologies are already in use in space, in the different space programs. Um, it's not something new, but something that will be shared more widely when it will be safe to share them that's what i'd say yeah i i uh, as far as new technologies and inventors you know the system the patent system which has been controlled by the crown of england using ses for quite some time which had control of the patent office by the way uh you know people who have come up with all these things it didn't end well for them so I don't know that there's a lot of trust in that structure and system the way it is still, um, you know, because your your technology, your ideas would be stolen, and then they would uh, they would blacklist it, and they you know persecute the inventor to make sure they never talked about it, or they would just eliminate it. And you know, there's a huge history of this shift. Now, as far as it coming all at once, no, I think it's going to be a very systematic rollout. I mean, just using Nikola Tesla's technology of Earth's resonant field for energy, for electricity, that would change the entire world, just that one piece of technology. And then you bring in the med beds. Oh, my God. Profound change. Um, in everybody's life. There's not a single person who wouldn't be touched by a med bed. And the additional uh, opportunities for uh, longevity and a longer life. Um, And then of course, there's the uh, extraterrestrial tech, much of what's been here, but they didn't know what it did. They didn't know how to use it. They couldn't turn it on, they couldn't operate it. So what did they do? They buried it in archives under the Smithsonian, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Iraqi Museum of History. You know, you didn't mention that, you know, one of the things that they did in, in Baghdad was go in there and pull out everything that was in the basement because it was all extraterrestrial. Yeah. So, you know, and Saddam Hussein knew what it was he just couldn't use it, you know, because he couldn't turn it on. So, 
you know, it's, it's, it's a fascinating time. It really is. It's, it's the past, present, and the future all coming together at once on this tiny little planet. And we all have front row seats for the show. Yeah, we are indeed uh, in, in the front row waiting for the next act to uh, begin. And it seems that uh, some ET groups are very active on Earth. And uh, Elena, you, you met an ET in Ireland who says that she was from Alpha Centauri and that she was working on some advanced technology in uh, California. We assume that was Paradise, California, that was burned down because she said the town was burnt down. So, you know, why is it, or what do you know about the Alpha Centaurians? And I think you recently have, have an update on what they're doing in our solar system. So can you tell us about the Alpha Centaurians and what they're doing to help introduce some of this advanced technology to Earth? Sure, Michael. Well, there are different cultures in the Alpha Centauri systems. There are three star systems in there. And um, mostly is the Meton and the Silosi, or Silosians. And they are uh, involved with um, space programs and um, building new, new uh, space fleets and developing new technology on Earth since the 1950s. Um, and um, they they are very much like us. They look like us. It's mind blowing. You you can't tell it's uh, an ET. You can't uh, absolutely you can't. And they have they are settled in and they're living among us. They are settled in our societies, um, etc. Well, um, yes, they. This person I met was um, just visiting and. Uh, she 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 took contact with me to talk about um she didn't tell much about her life that she was coming from california and that her old little town was burnt and many of them died and they were working on developing advanced connectivity technologies it was about connectivity and this person just advised me to trust Starlink systems because it was going to be the future of communications and it would use a connectivity based on quantum technology and it will be something new and I need to trust that she delivered to me this message. Uh, they, she mentioned that they were all working on these, this new advanced technology in this town that was burned. So we, well, Michael, you, you you came with the conclusion that it had to be paradise, and I totally agree. Recently, uh, Thorhan was accompanying a, a convoy coming from the Alpha Centaurian systems, especially the planet Silo, to colonize, to settle on Mars. These uh, people from the, these new colons uh, are settling on Mars with a new, with new Earth colonies. And they are going to work together and they are going, the, the earth colons are going, uh, settlers are going to learn about new technology, technologies from these Alpha Centaurians, about agricultures, biodomes, and uh, they're going to work together and settle together. This was prepared a, a month and month before. Of course, I wasn't told because for probably safety reasons, uh, there were a series of meetings on Silo and also on uh, Ganymede. I saw once uh, a month ago, there was a meeting on Ganymede in a facility of the Intergalactic Confederation between inter the, the Cedars people, the Guardians, and uh, a delegation of Martians. But the real Martians, you know, the reptilians, uh, there wasn't an insectoid there. The reptilians are... Uh, just leading and you know, the Martian society now they are free. They, they used to be called the Martian resistance, but now they are really empowered and are, they've re won their planet. So they were um, discussing on Ganymede about the future of Mars. I didn't know much at that time. And now I know that it was just last week as we speak, 
um, it was to prepare uh, this new redistribution of, of Mars, where the locals, the reptilians and the insectoids, insectoids anyway, would have the, the, the primer of everything. It's their planet, and the others are just invited to, to settle there. That, that's what I um, I know about the, the input of the Alpha Centaurians uh, recently. How about you, Alex? Do you know anything about um, different ET groups living amongst uh, humanity and seeding technologies? I have met some. I have met some. Okay. Uh, can you elaborate on that or is that... Uh... <laughs> uh... Some work in government, um, some work for aerospace contractors. And, and Elena is absolutely right. You would never know unless they, they showed you. And um, I knew a woman that I became very, very close with who worked for the Franchise Tax Board in the state of California. And um, we're still friends to this day. And some of them have actually had children. They have offspring here. So they've invested everything in seeing that this, this, this process, this journey that we're all on is successful because they have seeded their own here as well. And that's all I'm going to say at this point. Well, that's great. That's corroborating uh, some of the information I've gotten from other sources. Uh, uh, Bill Tompkins, who worked in the aerospace industry, he talked about uh, these extraterrestrials being embedded in major companies like Douglas Aircraft Company, McDonnell Douglas, TRW, and so forth, and, and all helping uh, develop advanced technologies, helping the Navy uh, develop these advanced technologies. So, yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. So with uh, this quantum communication system uh, that Starlink and Elon Musk are setting up, uh, based on the information you've received, Elena, um, yeah, this this is not something to be worried about because I know people assume that the Starlink system is is going to be like um, something that's just going to beam all these harmful five G uh, EMFs uh, to us. And uh, and as far as I know, with my kind of research into this, it's, it's like Starlink is actually developing a different model. They're not using the five G system that say. Companies like Verizon and AT and T and the major telecommunications industries do, which is all based on five G and six G, that, that they are developing a quantum internet. And I, I know you both attended my webinar uh, last week, and you know, there was something called Project Odin that I haven't been able to really confirm. There's a lot of rumors about it. So you know that's that's supposed to be where SpaceX. Uh, where uh, SpaceX, Starlink are working with uh, US Space Command in setting up a kind of quantum internet system. So, yeah, do either of you know anything about, about that? Well, I don't know anything about the project Odin, but I know about Odin. <laughs> Odin was a Norse god. He was the father of all god and gods. And Odin died to reborn and gain knowledge. So Odin represents um, something that is pushed to the limit that it breaks out, breaks down and nearly dies. And by the death experience, by the transformation, becomes a new being that has gained absolute knowledge in the process. To me, this is a metaphor for a system that is not working anymore, that dies and that switches to something new 
And this something new has to do with knowledge or sharing knowledge. That's what Odin represents to me. Thank you. That's very profound. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Alex, do you have any information on that? Uh, as a platform, it, its sole purpose is to um, elevate all consciousness. And the way it works is that it moves in between many different frequencies. And, you know, the fact that it's quantum means that its ability is not just limited to third density. Its ability also opens fourth density. And it can also open fifth density. It all depends on how much they decide to turn up the juice on it. So if we wanted to actually talk to the rest of the cosmos using this type of a technology could in fact do that. If we wanted genuine galactic knowledge, this system would give us access to it. We would never get it with the system that's in the that's presently in existence, the platforms we've been using, Xfinity, Comstore, Comcast, uh, Verizon, any of those. Those systems were never built. They were built to contain information and knowledge, not to expand it. Even the internet, the intention was to share data and information. What happened was humanity really took to it and information was going and moving and being spread so fast that they had to contain it. They had to start to shut it down because consciously we were beginning to outgrow the internet. They weren't able to contain the information. So, and it was never designed for this, the system we are currently using. The quantum system, completely different platform. It actually complements the fact that humanity's consciousness is expanding and it will allow us to expand on a consciousness level because it's built to pick up information that's just not third, but fourth and fifth. Knowledge. Exactly. It's, it's a whole new world. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, sorry, Elena, go ahead. If I may say, uh, to give you an example, I, I, realized, I realized I have this technology within me, in my body. The, the implant device that I have works like this. It's a quantum resonance communication. Wherever Thoran is in the galaxy, the distance doesn't matter. We can connect because there is no medium between one point to the other. The two devices are um, interacting by quantum. Something is triggered here, it triggers here, but there's nothing in between that can be hacked. It's unhackable. Right. So that's something important as well. It's unhackable. It's so like a laser. Example. It, it's like a laser. Um, you, you know, many of the military now use lasers for communication. Well, you break the beam, everybody knows it, okay? Yeah. And, and you've broken the beam. The quantum system is, is exactly just what she said. You're point A, point B, and it's only you two having the conversation. Yeah. Um, you know, to, have, to use true holographic technology, you have to have the quantum system in place so you can pull it down. We would never be able to generate the, elect, the energy necessary to truly do something like this on a global level. You know, and, and, and you know, everybody's talking about Project Blue Beam and all that stuff. You know, that would never work if they hadn't chemtrailed the entire sky for 25 years. You know, if they didn't put all that shit in the atmosphere, it never would work. So literally what we're seeing is like a film being bounced off our atmosphere because of all the particles that they put in it. You know, that was the intention. Mm -hmm. 
And well, you know, well, they 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 can they can take ships, fly them with a resonance right through our atmosphere, and all those particles will come down to the surface and be completely harmless. So, you know, we're gonna be okay. Yeah. We're gonna be okay. Well, and that's uh, one of the things that uh, people would really love to know more about is right now everyone's being bombarded with a new wave of kind of fear porn. The mass media is just pumping images of war and and they're kind of like they're dangling this prospect of a nuclear war uh, with the U.S. So, uh, you know, a lot of people are starting to get scared, but I, I know I've been following... Uh, the, the, the Patriot movement, you know, people like one or seven, Michael Jaco, uh, many others saying that uh, you know, this is a, there's a giant show playing out at the moment, and that in, part of the show is that we need to get to the very brink to wake up the normies, and and that very brink is, you know, nuclear war it wakes people up, and then it's like okay, then you can then you can kind of like unleash. Oh, the White Hats can spring into action and kind of like unleash the public uh, broadcasting system and announcing all of the stuff that's being held. I think, Alex, you've talked about that, um, you know, like packets of information that's just going to be rolled out when people have reached the, the, the right, when the critical mass has been reached. So, yeah, can yeah, like when they can actually about hear that? the information, well, they actually can hear it. Right now, most people would turn it off because they're not ready to hear it. Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, no matter what you say about Ukraine or Russia, you're going to trigger somebody. Um, you know, but the bottom line is, and you know, this information's out there. Ukraine is not a separate country. It never legally defined its borders. So technically, as far as the UN is concerned, and they know this, Going back to 1991, Ukraine is still an extension of Russia because they have no treaties whatsoever designating their borders. None. They never did it. Two, there are people on the ground and foreign correspondents who were saying it's the Ukrainian military and mercenaries that are blowing up and bombing the Ukrainian people. And the media is spinning it, saying it's the Russians. You know, um, now it's possible that in taking out some of these bases and bio um, uh, bio structures that have been created there, you know, that some innocent civilians are being being killed. I'm sure that's possible, but you know. Why isn't everybody asking, why were there so many bio labs there? You know, why were there so many? Why were we paying for all that shit? And what was it exactly they were doing? You see, we can't have that conversation. We can't have that conversation yet because they won't let us. You know, what was billions and billions of dollars going on there what were they doing, you know? And the adrenochrome labs that were there. Why don't you explain that? Let's have a conversation about that, but we can't because of all the fear porn and the nuclear war, just go back to Steve Greer's disclosure project. What were the extraterrestrials doing at all the military bases, nuclear military bases on the planet. They were turning those things off. They were melting circuit boards. They were telling every military that had a nuke, you are not gonna use it because it affects us. It doesn't just hurt you. It creates a wave dimensionally because you're ripping holes in time. Yeah. They're not gonna let us use them. You know, they're just not going to let it happen. But, you know, there's plenty of other shit we could use, like bioweapons and anthrax and all this other crap that they were building and, and making, you know, for God knows why. 
um, you know, that they could do something stupid with. But, you know, that's why we have all these boots on the ground, Michael, is to make sure that doesn't happen. Because not only do you have Starseed, but you also have physical represent, re representatives of other star nations here living amongst us. Yeah. You know, I, you know, we're still in the vaudeville part of the show here. You know, the stupidity, you know, and, and, and those of us who have been awake a while, you know, we're like really done with this, with the vaudeville show, you know. You know, let's get real serious now about, you know, taking humanity to the next level. It's just, Christ, it's so frustrating. Oh frustrating is the word. Yeah. You know, so, uh, did you want to elaborate at all, Elena, on this idea that what we're witnessing now is is just a show? I mean, that it's it's got to be scary because that's what's going to have to that's what's needed to wake up the normies. Is this similar to the information you've received? Well, the information I receive is that uh, people need to get up and just stand up for themselves and, and just get rid of the all those the deep state people in power and just stand up. And the, the way, the best way to do it is to stop consenting to to do what they tell you to do stop uh accepting their fear information everything that's fear based it comes from the bad side you know and you know this 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 conflict with uh regressive extraterrestrials the orion group the reptilians blah 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 you know the, the Galactic Federation and the, the alliance they are in, they could have just just sort this everything out in one hour. <laughs> they didn't. First, because uh, they didn't want to transform the Earth in a battlefield and kill everyone. But second, and that's uh, in fact the first, it's the most important, humanity needs to wake up and shift to the next level of consciousness. They need to do that. And uh, they, humanity has been in an abusive relationship with a narcissistic uh, deep state. And nobody can take us out of it. We need to just wake up ourselves. And sometimes when you're in an abusive relationship with a partner, whatever it is, whatever level, you need, if you don't realize and you don't have the courage to get out, you need to take hits until you, you say you're fed up and you just go, that, that's enough now, enough. And you just stop consenting to be abused and you move on and you just, you take away. Actually, you don't need to kill your abuser. You need just to take the power away from them. That's all you need to do. Stop feeding them. Stop saying yes. You say, bye. You ignore them. You take the power away and they just wither. That's what we need to do. And humans have started to stand up all over the world. And it's great. And uh, finally, it's happening. But the thing is, we, we need to stop waiting. They, they've, they've groomed us in waiting for something or someone to save us or to do the job for us. Uh, for us. And no, it's humans need to save humans. You know, um, that's what I'm told. But it's happening. Mm -hmm. So both of you have expressed a lot of optimism that uh, as this year plays out, that we're going to have many positive things happening. So do you still feel that way about 2022 and beyond? Maybe we can start with Alex and finish with Elena. Oh, definitely. Definitely. You know, there's, there's no shit show lasts forever, you know, and no storm lasts forever either. either. At some point it passes and the sun comes back out. You know, I mean, that's just the nature of, of what is. And um, yeah, it, 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 you know, the, we're three years from now, we're going to look back at this moment and we're going to be like, wow, what was that all about? You know, why did we buy so buy into it? 
because we're going to have a very clear perspective, you know, just a couple years down the road about everything that was going on here, how we were being played, how we were being lied to, how we were being manipulated. And once everybody sees that, or a majority of people see that, it's over. It's, it's done. They can never do that again. And, you know, Michael, as far as the normies, I'm not sure that any more normies are going to wake up. I think those who are awake are awake already. Those that can be awake and will be awake, they're already awake. I think the small percentage of people who just won't get it, they're never going to get it. And I think we're there. I do. I, I think they know. Um, but, you know, this was part of the plan. This was part of the rollout. And they can't change course because they've laid this thing out the way it's supposed to play in order to achieve a very specific ending. So they have to do this anyway. They can't just say, OK, you know, what? let's support this. It's too late for that. They have to play this thing out. And what it's going to do is those who are awake, it's going to make us much more resolute in the idea of being um, self-reliant, self-responsible, and never giving our power away to a corporate or governmental structure ever again. And what this will do is it, it will make us resolve all of humanity that any structure we build to service us, we will in fact control. They will not control us. It's never going to happen again. And uh, you know, I, I for one, am, I'm ready to let's 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 move on now. You know, let let's get to the end here. Well, uh, that brings me to the end. Uh, so, Elena. Uh, where do people find out about what you're doing? I mean, upcoming books or books that you have available. And if they want to get in touch with you, where, where do people go? Thank you, Michael. Um, first, I, I would like to, uh, to say that I'm feeling very optimistic for the future. I've been shown a future where everyone is federated in a civilized society on Earth. And all these new technologies are everywhere. So I've seen that. It's very close. Um, I've been told that July, something may happen that can change the vision humans have about their own presence in the universe and in their history. So let's wait and see what this will be. Maybe disclosure, I don't know. Um, I feel very positive. I believe, I trust in human race. And, you know, my friends upstairs, they said to me once, if we thought there was no hope, we wouldn't be here. So that's, that's all. Um, now where to find me? Um, well, uh, elenadanan.org, you have everything I do on it. Uh, my website, my books, or everything is centralized there. And my YouTube channel, Elena Danan, where I have all my uh, free videos and uh, workshops and everything. Thank you. So, Alex, uh, what about you uh, in terms of your, I know you're doing uh, regular webinars and uh, people can contact you for uh, Q&A. Uh, so how do people do that? Well, I, we do three. We do two webinars and a Q&A every month. Um, I haven't restarted the one on ones yet. Um, so that's on hold. Uh, but AlexCollier.org. Um, you know, there's a body of work that's out there scattered throughout the internet um, that hasn't been fully taken down yet. Um, so there's there's all, all kinds of places and um, you know that's that's pretty much it. You know, and and trying to support others who are not only in this field but you know those who are. The, you know, contactees and such that are, you know, putting their toe in the water to see what it's like. Um, you know, they'll be happy to know that it's not like it was 30 years ago. <laughs> you know, it, the people are much more open 
at this point. And um, it's a lot easier to have these types of conversations. Um, so, you know, it's that, and, and it's both Elena and I supporting you in your work. And, you know, why don't you tell people, Michael, how they can find out about more about your work? <laughs> yes, well, uh, people can just visit my website, exapolitics.org. That's my central hub, and I put uh, everything mm -hmm. on there. And I also have um, another website I just created, exopoliticstoday.com, where people can get my podcasts and they can watch this. Maybe they're watching this now. So I want to thank you both, Alex and Elena, for, for really giving us so much wisdom, so much guidance. I know this is a, a difficult time for many. Uh, they're looking for hope. They're looking for guidance. And both of you have that in abundance. So it's really an honor to know both of you and to be working with you. So thank you and aloha. Thank you, Michael. And my best to Angelica. I'd even doubt it you. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Okay, you have been listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Solomon. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Solomon. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.